Hi. Um, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming back from the coffee break. I appreciate that. Um, as Peter said, I'm Lily. Um, and today I want to tell you a tale of mischief and mayhem and mustaches. Okay, let's get on with it. All right, well, actually, before I jump into that, I need to tell, tell you a little bit more about me and my history. Um, and again, there's my Twitter handle, in case you don't have it already. So I write code, and I get paid to be professionally paranoid about computers. It's a good time. Um, but before I worked in tech, I was a historian. And I studied the Middle Ages in Europe, and I read Latin, and I did all of that kind of stuff. And then when I left the history industry, when I left academia, um, and joined the technology industry, I found that there were a lot of discussions that we were having as techies that had been had many, many other times in the past, particularly around privacy and security and things like this. And one of the things that I find is very valuable about being a historian is that you have the ability to look back at these things and study them in great depth and draw lessons out of them that apply even now so that we can hopefully avoid repeating some of these mistakes from the past. So I wanted to tell you this story because literally nothing much has changed since this happened than the clothes and the hair. So it's still got a lot that we can learn from it. So I want to, you know, wind back the clock a little bit and take you back to the year 1903 in the United Kingdom. This is a telegraph. And um, I'll explain a little bit about what the telegraph was, because I know that there are probably some of you who were born after the cassette stopped being a thing. And I don't want to make any assumptions about your knowledge of this technology, because it is a fair bit older. So, as I said, this is a picture of a telegraph receiver. And in 1903, the telegraph was pretty much the most cutting-edge communications technology that existed on the planet. People would send each other messages in Morse code, the little dots and dashes along great big lengths of copper wire that were everywhere. And this particular picture so it shows a telegraph receiver with a printer. You can see the bit of paper going through it. And it prints out the dots and dashes as they were received by the receiver so that somebody then could transcribe them back into letters of the alphabet and send a message on to whoever was intended to receive it. But although the tech looked different, the amount of drama that went on in the community was pretty much about the same as it is now. And I can't go into all of this because we would, it would take literally the rest of the day to actually get into all of the dramatic things that went on and all of the fights that people had and all of the discussions and debates. But here's a quick summary. So the wired telegraph had already changed the world. And before that, messages could only go about as fast as a train could go. And the telegraph that meant that it enabled fast communication, nearly instantaneous in some cases if you were actually at a telegraph office. It had, revolutionized, it had revolutionized police work and dating and business and a lot of society. It was pretty cool. And then the transatlantic telegraph was built. And this was the first undersea telegraph cable. It connected up two continents for the first time. Previously, it would have taken a ship weeks and weeks to get the letters on board across from one continent to another. Suddenly, it would take minutes, even yeah, hours or even minutes, for people to receive messages from the other side of the world. This was mind-blowing, and this changed a whole bunch of ways that business worked, particularly. And then, radio waves were discovered. And this blew everyone's minds. Nobody was really sure what they would be good for, but scientists were still very, very, very excited about them. And some forward thinkers were trying to think about whether they could be used to electrically charge things. Some people were thinking about transmitting signals over distance. Um, some people were thinking about Morse code. And a lot of the physics 
and the laws of the ele- and, and laws of electronics that we take for granted today that contribute to our understanding of how radio works were things that they simply didn't have at that point in time. They were still discovering things about them. And for them, radio waves presented a really interesting new challenge because it meant that you could do this stuff long, long distance, but again, it seemed a bit like magic because they hadn't figured it out. And people talked about it, talked about radio tech at the very least, as this sort of cool, shiny new thing, a little bit like the way we talk about the cloud now. And everybody really wanted to get into this business, and they wanted to be an etheric engineer. And I think this is a really cool title that we should bring back, because it would look amazing on business cards, just as an aside. But anyway, this was where we're at technologically at this point in time. And I want to introduce you to the etheric engineers that are relevant to this story. First up, there's this guy. This is Guglielmo Marconi. And he's the guy who usually gets the credit for inventing the radio. He was also one of the first startup founders in the way that we think of a startup today. He was a bit like uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak mushed together in one person, if you can imagine such a thing. Um, He was a really hands-on developer who wasn't afraid to challenge ideas and just try things, even if they seemed really out there. But he was also a very shrewd businessman, to the point where if a personal connection got in the way of his business work, he would just forget about that person entirely. He was completely focused on the business. Another important thing about his radio work is that he was not a formally educated scientist. This was a really big deal in the early 20th century. A lot of his work was very experimental, and he didn't know the theory. He was just trying stuff. He would literally get there with wires, and he would twist them to a certain length, and then test it to see how that affected the radio signal. And then he would you know, draw them out a little bit more, and then test that to see how that affected the radio signal. He was just playing with it to see what happened, to see what configurations were good. There was no theory. He was what they called back in those days a practitioner. And there was a huge big divide then between practitioners, who were people like Marconi, who just went and tried stuff to see what would happen, and the scientists, who were, you know, the guys at the universities with big beards and published papers and um, thought that they were very important and usually had titles. Um, But these scientists, they treated scientific knowledge like this kind of public domain repository of things that were for the good of humankind. They were just putting it out there. And then practitioners, like Marconi, were often more interested in these ideas because they thought that they could make money out of them. So there was a bit of a, a, bit of a split in the practice. And practitioners, needless to say, they didn't get very much respect from scientists. So this caused a bit of problem for Marconi. Another thing that it's good to know about Marconi is that he was the great-grandson of John Jamison of Jamison's Whiskey. And his Jamison, the Jamison side of his family provided the money that funded the Marconi company initially. So if you're at the bar later during the party and they have any whiskey there, you might want to have a glass of whiskey and thank it for the fact that the radio exists. Okay, next guy. This is Neville Maskelyne. He's a pretty cool guy. He also comes from a really, 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 really long line of guys who were all called Neville Maskelyne. And this made finding a picture of him for this slide really hard, because both his father and his son were more famous than he was. But I'm pretty sure that this is him, so let's just go with that. Cool. All right. Anyway, so Maskelyne was an amateur radio experimenter at about the same time as Marconi. And he was also a practitioner. He wasn't a trained scientist. But the coolest part of his career was that he was a ghostbuster. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So around the early 20th century, in, in England, in the US in particular, a belief in ghosts became really, really, really popular. People would um, get together and hold seances and light candles and hold hands, and there'd be Ouija boards, and um, there would be mediums who said that they could communicate with the spirits. 
and they would often charge people a lot of money for the privilege of communicating with their long-lost dead grandmother or whatever. Um, and quite often, they were not genuine about it. So, Maskelyne was often called in to prove a lot of these people wrong. And he used lots of scientific methods, really cutting edge at that point in time, to expose a lot of these spirit mediums as false and to stop them from charging money for things that was essentially a hoax. Um, and because of a lot of this work, he was familiar with a lot of the really cutting edge technology at the time, because that's what a lot of these spirit mediums were using as well. And he was also a magician. Um, he ran a theater in London called The Egyptian, where he would put on magic shows, which was pretty cool. And he learned a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that he learned from being a ghostbuster, he put into his magic shows, um, because it looked a lot like magic. I mean, you could, um, you could press a button up here on the stage, and then a bell would ring on the other side of the room, and people would lose their minds. I mean, okay, this is basically how a doorbell works. But in 1903, they had never seen this before, and they thought that it was the coolest thing ever. You know, you could pick up that doorbell and walk around with it and press the button, and it would still ring every time. It was incredible to them. And so he was quite successful as a magician. Anyway, okay, he was really cool. We will get back to him. This is the last guy that we need to know about. John Ambrose Fleming. And Fleming was a scientist. He fell in the scientist side of that scientist-practitioner divide. Um, and he was a physicist as well. He had had decades of experience with what they called, you know, traditional English science, university-style stuff. So his credentials meant that scientists would listen to him. So Marconi, being a savvy businessman, hired him to basically be his public-facing science person and get him some respectability in the science sphere. Because, you know, again, he was a practitioner, so he didn't know anything. So let's hire a guy who does, according to these scientists, and put him at the front to be the spokesman. And it also really helped that Fleming loved Marconi and his work. He was a huge Marconi fanboy. And he would write really long articles in the newspapers about all of these things that Marconi had done and how awesome it was, and then Marconi would, like, make lots of money. Okay, so he was like a, a PR guy in a lab coat. So these three guys, these are our main guys. So in 1903, Marconi had a really, really, really big problem. Actually, he had three of them. At the time, radio scientists were struggling with the problem of syntony over distance. Syntony is what we would call tuning a signal, how you would get it to be at a specific frequency, and distance was how far that signal was going to go when you broadcast it. And most people at the time believed that you could only have one at the expense of the other. You know, you could have a very tuned signal that would go a very short way, or you could have a very untuned, broad signal that would go across quite a lot of frequencies, but a very long distance. So this was, this was a huge problem. And Marconi had been struggling with this for some time, because this was a serious blocker to his business, and he couldn't make any money if he didn't fix it. Getting the tuning over distance thing right was especially important for ship-to-shore communication. So, if you had hundreds of ships out at sea, you didn't want all of the radio signals from all of them to interfere with each other. So, tuning became this really important thing. And for Marconi, this was really important because shipping and shipping radios made up the majority of the Marconi company's business. And before radio, it's important to understand how revolutionary this was. Before radio, ships out at sea were just cut off from the rest of the world. There was no communication. Even when you had the telegraph, you couldn't run a cable out to a ship. It, would, it wouldn't really work. Um, so ships would just sort of sail off and then hopefully turn up where they were supposed to turn up, but about the time they were supposed to turn up there. And quite often, this would lead to a lot of problems, as it does when you can't communicate with people in some way. Um, if a ship, if a, a ship was approaching a storm, for example, radio suddenly made it possible for people 
other ships or people on the coast to warn people on the radio about people on the ship about the storm, and then they could get into shore, and it would save lives, and it would save the cargo. So this was really cool, and it became an extremely important thing. And Marconi had pretty much a monopoly on this entire business of ship radios, and so he rushed to lodge a patent for this new tuning technology that he had developed because he wanted to maintain it. And this was the patent. It's called the patent of the four sevens because it was number 7777. Okay. Um, and this describes a method of tuning a transmitter and a receiver to the same frequency so that they would receive this message at this specific frequency. And Marconi had advertised radio tuning as a security feature because if you didn't know the frequency, then you couldn't intercept that message. And the lack of the interference was really the main thing that Marconi was making all of his money from. And again, because he had a monopoly, he was making a lot of it. But there was one problem with this. Marconi had not actually figured out how to do this. He just said he had, and kind of hoped that he would work it out later. <laughs> I mean, this is the plot of most movies. But this was 1903, and the only movies they had at this point were like sort of 10-minute adaptions of Alice in Wonderland. And so Marconi had never seen a movie to know this, this was a really bad idea. Anyway, Maskelyne had problems of his own. He was a competing radio engineer, and he wanted to experiment, and he found that every time he tried to approach a new aspect of radio technology, Marconi had usually gotten there before him and patented all of it. So if he wanted to do anything, he would either have to break the law or pay Marconi lots of money. And again, because a lot of stuff about radios concerns the basic laws of physics, it was really hard to do anything with the radio without using this stuff. That's just how radio works. Um, and so Maskelyne was also annoyed because he knew that Marconi quite often didn't tell the truth about a lot of the stuff that he had developed. And this was a criticism that a lot of people made about Marconi, because he was making a lot of money, but with this tech, he didn't give his investors or pretty much anybody else any details about the stuff he was building and how it worked. When he did a demonstration for a potential buyer, in some cases, he would literally put a black box over his radio tech so that people couldn't see how it was put together and what it did. He was terrified of somebody taking his monopoly away from him, and he became very protective of it. And when he experimented on new technology, he usually only invited people that already worked for him and Fleming, who loved him anyway and would say good stuff about him no matter what he did. And then Fleming would write nice letters to the newspaper and Marconi would make a lot of money. Okay. And the reason that Maskelyne knew that Marconi's claims about this tuning technology being super secure and all of that, the reason Maskelyne knew that that wasn't true is because he had intercepted some of these communications himself. So Marconi had a radio station in Poldhu, which is in Cornwall, in Great Britain, and he was testing communication tuned communication with one of his ships out at sea. Maskelyne had another radio testing station nearby, not, you know, right next door, but nearby. That'd make a good sitcom. Um, and when he was working there one day, Maskelyne started receiving messages on the equipment, and he was confused because he didn't know where these messages were coming from. You know, they're just coming through, they look like nonsense test messages, but, you know, okay, that's interesting and he put them aside. And he didn't think anything, think anything of it at the time, but a couple of weeks later, he saw this huge long article from Fleming in the newspaper about Marconi's amazing tuning technology, and he realized that what he had intercepted were the tests, the test transmissions. And because Maskelyne's equipment wasn't tuned at all, not whatsoever, he knew that Marconi had to be lying about the fact that he had developed proper tuning technology. So what happened 
while Marconi thought he was just communicating to one ship out at sea, he was actually broadcasting this message everywhere, and it could be picked up by everybody on lots of frequencies. So Maskelyne decided to do the right thing. He sat down, and he went to report the vulnerability to the developers. So he picked up his nice fancy pen and you know, ink and all of that, and um, he wrote Marconi a letter to tell him about what he had intercepted. And Marconi ignored him. So, OK, um, I will write another letter. Marconi ignored him. Maskelyne was pretty annoyed. And then when he saw an ad in the newspapers that Marconi was now planning to demonstrate this fancy new tuning technology to the public and a lecture at the Royal Institution, and of course, there were going to be lots of investors there, it would be lots of good press, and he would make more money, Maskelyne was really cheesed off. So he had applied his knowledge for ghost-busting purposes. Now he was going to do this to the radio. So it's showtime. It was June 4th, 1903, and Fleming was at the Royal Institution in London. This was a common venue for really big science demonstrations. Lots of really important people had turned up with you know, top hats and monocles and beards and whatever they had in 1903 to see this big demonstration. And so Fleming was on stage, like this, giving a huge speech about the scientific achievements of Marconi's tech. And he had a radio receiver on stage with him because Marconi was going to demonstrate sending a message to, of, like, tuned message over distance to the Royal Institution in London, and it would be received right there. Fleming also had two assistants with him to help with the receiver. And Marconi was going to be down at his station in Cornwall, so this was quite a long way. It was going to be this huge, big, first public demonstration that this tech would work. The message from Marconi was scheduled to arrive at 7 p.m. sharp. That was when Fleming's lecture was going to end. Meanwhile, Maskelyne was also in London. His theater was not very far away from the Royal Institution, and he had installed this 10-inch induction coil in the theater. This, an induction coil, is really, really old school tech, even by 1903 standards. It was invented in, like, the 1830s. It was, you know, old. Um, and Maskelyne had also set up a few rules for his experiment. He deliberately didn't try to tune this thing at all. He just thought, okay, well, you know, if Marconi stuff is going to be tuned, I'm not going to tune it. And he wanted to use short waves because he knew Marconi was going to use long waves. He was trying to make it very hard to have any other outcome than the fact that Marconi had been lying. So he wanted to make sure his test was good. And then what he did was he composed a few messages to send via Morse code. And he made them as rude as he possibly could. <laughs> because he wanted to know that it had worked. And one of the best ways to get a reaction from somebody is to insult them. <laughs> so. Before Marconi's messages were received, you know, Fleming's here, the assistants are over there, the assistants started to notice that the receiver on the stage was printing something out. And they're like, OK. This is not probably the message from Marconi. It's not time yet, but OK, let's have a look. And when they started to read it, they saw that it was a lot of really rude poetry. <laughs> there was a young fellow of Italy who diddled the public quite prettily. It was actually what he sent. And then a bunch of Shakespeare, which got very long and rambly, but it must have been a pain to type out letter by letter. But hey, it's a hack. Um, and then the assistants are watching this spit out, and they're starting to panic, because this message is definitely not from Marconi. Fleming, who's standing up the front, he was getting on in years, and he had become quite deaf, and he did not hear or notice what was going on behind him. So he's standing up the front, talking about awesome Marconi and his awesome stuff. Um, and the assistants are back here panicking. But fortunately for them, this rude message cut off 
just before 7 p.m. when Marconi's message was scheduled to arrive. So one of the assistants tore off this bit of paper and put it in his pocket for later. And then the real message from Marconi came through and they tore that off and they showed it to the audience and the audience went, yay! And um, everybody applauded. And then they figured, okay, we're safe. Until Fleming went and uh, messed it up for the Marconi company completely. So when the assistants told Fleming about these messages, Fleming did what any Victorian-era English gentleman who was angry would do, and he wrote lots of letters. Firstly, he wrote to Marconi to let him know what had happened, and he said, there, is a, there has been a dastardly attempt to jam us, and if I can find out who did it, it will not be pleasant for him. Okay. And then Fleming wrote a letter to the Times newspaper. And pretty much like a school headmaster at this the assembly the morning after somebody has set fire to some bins or something, he demanded names. He wanted to know who had committed these acts of scientific hooliganism. But at the same time, he said, we can afford to laugh at this because his theory was that whoever had attacked them had used some really finely tuned stuff and a low... Um, a strong earth current, which would destroy the grounding of Marconi's fancy-tuned antenna. So run this big current, destroy the grounding of the antenna, and then send a really tuned message straight into the receiver. And he figured that was how he had, that had happened. Um, he was totally confident that Marconi's technology was solid. He did not believe that anything else could possibly have disrupted this broadcast. Unfortunately for Fleming, this letter was precisely what Maskelyne had been hoping he would do. And Maskelyne was very happy to out himself in the Times the next day as the attacker. And he emphasized, when he did this, that he had used a simple, untuned radiator broadcaster for his demonstration. And the justification he gave for doing this was that this hack was the only possible means of ascertaining fact which ought to be in the possession of the public. So Marconi hadn't made the specifics of his tech public at all. He hadn't provided impartial observers to his experiments. And then he had ignored Maskelyne's messages, telling him when something was wrong. And he had gone out and made a you know, public demonstration anyway, and he was counting on using that to make lots and lots of money. And what's more, Fleming's letter to the newspaper the previous day had proved that Maskelyne's hack had worked. So Maskelyne had succeeded in demonstrating very publicly that this new tuning technology was vulnerable to jamming and to interference, which was precisely the opposite of what Marconi had claimed. It was like a big neon sign saying, you're lying. There was not really any good defense to this, but the Marconi company tried really hard to weasel out of it anyway. The general theme of Fleming's letters back to Maskelyne, and this all took place in the Times newspaper, by the way, which you know, everybody would read over breakfast, so it was like a giant public flame war. Um, so the main theme of his defense was that Maskelyne should not have broken in on their demo because it wasn't fair. Hmm. And Fleming was especially angry that Maskelyne had dared to try doing this at a lecture at the Sacred Royal Institution, which was an, you know, a hall of science and tradition and uh, something. And he complained that what Maskelyne had done was a roughly uh, attempt to quite upset the rules of the game. And he was also upset because, according to him, the attacks were getting in through the back door which is the first time I know of that someone has used the phrase backdoor to talk about a flaw in somebody's security. And what happened after this is what happens when a lot of companies get hacked um, and they try to cover it up really badly. Marconi company shares tanked and Fleming especially suffered because his reputation as a scientist in particular took a huge hit. Um, he was the one who had stood up and vouched for Marconi as a scientist to the scientists, and this had clearly gone very wrong for him. He got fired. But what's more important is that the Maskelyne affair sparked a public debate about the intersection of commerce 
and technology and security and due diligence. Firstly, it pointed out that if tuning was going to work at all, there needed to be some kind of regulation of frequencies and transmitting devices, which is how radio still works today. Secondly, the other thing that came out of the hack was this conversation about responsible intersection of commerce and of science. So before Marconi, most people did science just because they wanted to discover new things about the universe. And nobody had really tried to patent any of this stuff before. So this became a really big problem. The general feeling was that if you were going to use the, literally the laws of the universe to make a profit for yourself, then you owed it to everybody to get those laws right and to get your tech right. And this meant that you, have, you had a moral responsibility to be clear when things went wrong and to try and make things better for everyone. So, okay, yeah, cool story, Lily, whatever. But it's been more than 100 years. So how is this useful? I think that Marconi's side of the story has a lot to offer developers and most businesses. It is a textbook example of how not to behave when you're trying to sell a cool new thing. Here are some things to remember. Technology always works best when you share the details of what you are building. Open sourcing your stuff means that other people get a chance to look at it and might notice something that you didn't see and then help you fix it, which is great. And this makes your work a lot stronger. And it gives other people a chance to learn, too. Secondly, testing. Proper testing is really important. Um, if you only test the things that you expect to happen, then the public is going to find those bugs, not you. And it's going to make you look really bad. Thirdly, if something is taking time and you're having trouble with it, you don't know how to figure something out, be open about it. Tell people. Because it looks good when you deliver something on time, sure. But it looks a lot better when you can be honest about your struggles and open and get other people's help and then deliver something that actually works. And lastly, don't forget about the old tech. Just because you have patched all of your servers against all of the latest bugs, it may, you, know, you have to build things that are still not going to be vulnerable to SQL injection. Because this is like having a really fancy camera system on your house and then leaving the window open. The old technology is still going to be a problem for you. You need to make sure that you plan for it. And for testers, Maskeline's side of the story is actually a really good example of what you should do if you discover a bug in somebody's work. Firstly, know your duty. If you see something that's not right, speak up about it. Secondly, notify the developers first. You have to immediately give, you have to give them a chance to fix it. You shouldn't just stand up and go public when you find a bug. This is bad because this is about as bad as exploiting the bug yourself. You give somebody else the opportunity to do it. Contact the people who made the product and let them know. Give them a chance to fix it first. And finally, if the bug is really bad, and if you've notified the company and given them enough time and the company has not done anything about it, then you might want to make some kind of public demonstration. But if you decide to do this, you have to stop before you do damage. Don't just go and steal the information just because you can prove, your ca prove you can, because that makes you just as bad as the people who wouldn't fix the bug. OK, so there's a lot I love about this story. But the thing I really like most is being able to share it with people, because I think it's cool. And I love to be able to hear everybody's reactions. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen.